This talk is one of hundreds of hours of leading Christian thinking. Go to www.euroleadershipresources.org and sign up to get our monthly email. More resources to support ministry are available to you now. The European Leadership Forum exists to connect local Christian leaders with God's global resources. All right, how's that? Okay. Yeah, we have nothing against the traditional reasons. It's just that my experience as an evangelism pastor is that trying to talk to strangers about the historical evidence for the bodily resurrection doesn't get you very far. Uh, but people are always willing to talk about some scientific discovery from the past three or four days. And so we use these new reasons as a bridge for the traditional reasons. And uh, this afternoon, I want to talk about uh, human origins. And throughout this week, we'll be addressing different uh, portions of the science disciplines and how they're providing new evidences for the Christian faith. So later on, I'll be talking about the origin of life, and uh, we'll be talking about um, some discoveries uh, about uh, dark energy and cosmic darkness. And I gave a talk uh, this morning about the new astronomical evidences for God. Also, I'll be participating in the dialogue on how do we interpret Genesis 1 through 3. And uh, that's something we're active in, not just doing research on the scientific issues, but doing research on the biblical issues. Uh, basically trying to help Christians integrate the 20 big creation accounts in the Bible. I don't know what it's like here in Europe, but in the States we have this perception that all the answers are in Genesis, when in fact most of the creation answers are outside the book of Genesis. So trying to encourage people to integrate the whole scope of Scripture and what you discover, for example, is that uh, Job 38 and 39, Psalm 104, and Proverbs 8 in particular have much more scientific content in it than anything you find in the book of Genesis. So that's what we're all about. And uh, this subject of human origins is probably the most controversial of all the creation evolution issues. It's something everybody gets emotional about. And I've got a slide here to kind of demonstrate uh, some of the emotional. I mean, you know all the story. You start with the primitive bipedal primate species you see on the left, and they claim that it gradually evolves into the advanced creature on the right. And incidentally, I've got a whole bunch of these slides for different uh, cultures. When I'm speaking in Japan, I put a sumo wrestler over there. Uh, when I'm in Canada, it's a hockey player. I mean, you can kind of work out your own sports bias uh, to make the point. And uh, the reason I, you know, I'm not going to do this today, but typically when I speak in human origins, I throw a lot of humor in because people get really uptight on the subject of human origins. You can just see the tension rise in the audience. And especially when you've got a mixed audience of Christians and non-Christians, uh, the tension can get very high. Uh, but the good news about human origins is that we have learned more in the past three or four years than we've learned since the beginning of time. Whereas three or four years ago, I would tell you that you could take the sum total of all the fossil bones for the hominids that have been discovered and fit it quite nicely into a closet. Well, today you need kind of the equivalent of a hotel room to do it. It's still not a lot of data, but it's a lot more than we've had before. I think what's particularly exciting is for the first time, we're recovering meaningful DNA evidence, not just from human beings, but from the other bipedal primate species. And so we're able to say a lot more about human origins from a scientific perspective than we ever could before. For example, four years ago, I would say there's no way we can compare the biblical date for human origins with a scientific date. Now we can make quite a definitive comparison. So that's what I'm going to talk to you all about. And in terms of the fossil record, it's in the textbooks that there's this beautiful tree where you start off with this... Uh, bipedal primate specimen that branches off into more complex bipedal primates. Well, now the consensus is we're not looking at a fossil tree for human origins, we're looking at a fossil bush. And, you know, six, five million years ago, you see a whole litany of bipedal primates, and they cover the whole realm of bipedal capability. And as you move up towards the present year, it remains bushy all the way through. And so this is a complete uh, uh, unexpected result from an evolutionary perspective. From an evolutionary perspective, you would demand a tree. It must be a tree in order for this to have a natural explanation. The fact that it looks like a bush 
uh, where you have several stumps at the base and no more stumps at the top, and the fact that every time they find a new bipedal primate species, and they typically find a new one every year, uh, but every new one throws the whole evolutionary discipline to chaos because every new discovery fails to fit the evolutionary paradigm. Now that by itself, I think, is a really significant apologetic insight uh, that the new discoveries are throwing the discipline into chaos rather than pulling it into order and developing some explanatory power. Uh, but one of the questions we need to address from a Christian perspective, if indeed there's this uh, forest of bipedal primates, why would the God of the Bible create all these bipedal primate species? Why not just create human beings and be done with it? Why do we see this litany of bipedal primates that, that literally starts six and a half million years ago and goes up to the present day? What divine purposes are behind that? Well, in terms of trying to come up with some evolutionary order uh, for the time sequence of the bipedal primate species, there isn't any. But there is one from a Christian perspective. In this sense, of what we observe is that every successive bipedal primate species is a little more capable than the previous one to hunt birds and mammals. So the earliest ones are not very effective at all. In fact, there's some doubt whether they even... Uh, had much of their diet uh, come from birds and mammals. But by the time you get to Homo sapiens idaltu and uh, Neanderthals, they're quite effective at uh, uh, killing birds and mammals. In fact, with uh, particularly uh, Neanderthals, uh, it looks like 100% of their diet uh, came from large bird and uh, mammal, uh, large body size bird and mammal species. Now, from a Christian perspective, this makes sense. And that when God created Adam and Eve, our planet had 22,000 bird species. Today, it has only 9,000. Uh, how did those 13,000 disappear? Basically, we human beings ate them all. Uh, we drove them to extinction. And uh, likewise, we did the same thing with the land mammals. When Adam and Eve uh, first showed up on the scene, there were 8,000 land mammal species on the planet. Today, there's only 4,000. Uh, North America, for example, before uh, humans invaded about 12,000 years ago, was filled with camels, lions, uh, tigers, uh, horses, um, all kinds of uh, yeah, elephants. Uh, but when the humans came over the uh, Bering Land Bridge, within about 1,000 years, they drove all the large uh, land, land mammal species to extinction. And now, from a Christian perspective, we understand how this happened. If you look in Genesis chapter 1, God commands Adam and Eve to manage the planet for the benefit of all life. Uh, Adam and Eve were put in charge of the planet. That's one reason why God told them, you are to multiply, to be fruitful, and to multiply and occupy the whole planet. I mean, how can you take care of the resources of the planet for the benefit of all life if you don't multiply to a degree where you can actually occupy the entire planet? In that sense, I think there's a biblical mandate for biologists to catalog all the species of life on planet Earth. And uh, even at this point, we probably only catalog 25%. So in that sense, we're just beginning to fulfill a portion of that mandate uh, in Genesis 1, uh, 29 through to uh, 31. But what you see in the last verse of Genesis 1 is that we have God commanding Adam and Eve to take special care of the green plants. Uh, green plants are the base of the food chain. And this is why a lot of people look at that passage and say this implies that all life was vegetarian. No, that was the case that it simply mentioned plants. But the focus on green plants is a, an instruction to Adam and Eve that if you're going to manage the resources of the planet for the benefit of all life, number one priority, take care of the green plants. Because if you don't take care of those, then nobody gets to eat. Uh, but then we know what happened. Genesis chapter 3, uh, Adam and Eve fall into sin. And uh, when they fall into sin, they begin...